In thermal physics, it's important also to talk about specific heat capacity. Uh, first of all, I think it helps to talk about just the definition, and then we can actually talk about how to use that to uh, solve uh, questions. So I'm going to have an example to show you about how you can solve something that may seem really nasty, and it turns out it's really straightforward, well, mostly. Um, so first of all, what is specific heat capacity? I'm just going to short form it. Specific heat capacity, SHC. It's just going to be, um, well, it's the energy needed. This is an important definition to memorize. So it's the energy needed to raise the temperature of one unit of mass of material by one degree Kelvin. I don't mean 1,000, I mean one degree Kelvin. So this is a definition for specific heat capacity. Okay, this is the energy needed to raise one unit of mass of material. Now that sounds silly. Normally uh, it's just because it's meant to be a little bit generic. So you might have one gram of material or one kilogram. You might have one liter because uh, actually it turns out liter is related to kilograms. Uh, so it turns out that uh, you can look at this as raising one, let's say, let's say one kilogram. So if you raise one kilogram of this material, if you raise its temperature by one degree Kelvin, that's the specific heat capacity. Different materials uh, take different amount of energies to raise the temperature. So water has a very specific, uh, pardon the pun, specific, specific heat capacity. Uh, it's like 4,186 if I remember correctly. So that's the amount of energy you need in order to raise you know, water's temperature by one degree Kelvin. Now the reason why it's called specific is because that's related to its mass. If you just had heat capacity without the word specific, then that would be simply the amount of energy needed to raise the material temperature by one degree Kelvin. So there we're not doing it, you know, for each kilogram, we're doing it for the whole block of ice or whatever it is you're looking at. But almost always, especially in physics SL, you'll see specific heat capacity being referenced. And there we're talking about the energy needed. Now remember we talked about energy, and energy is related to heat. Remember the, um, the definition for heat we just saw was uh, a transfer of energy between a system and its surroundings. And remember the letter we used was Q. That was a measure of, uh, of energy. So it turns out then the specific heat capacity is going to be referenced in this equation. And notice it goes Q equals MC delta T. This is the key equation here. This is the equation for specific heat capacity. This is in your data booklet. So this right here talks about, uh, well, let's just uh, define everything. So Q equals, uh, well, it's the heat, which is measured in joules. Then we have M. M is the mass. Now the mass could be in grams or it could be in kilograms. Those are the most common things you're going to see for the mass. I'm going to go with delta T for right now. Delta T is going to be a change in temperature. So here, remember, delta in physics is, well, even in mathematics, is used to denote a change. So in other words, uh, let's say the temperature goes from 5 to 10 degrees. You know, so if you go from 5 to 10, well, your change in temperature would be 10. So change in temperature. And there it could be in degrees Celsius or Kelvin. Doesn't matter. And the key thing here, the new thing, is C. Now C normally, uh, you're used to seeing it as, uh, sorry, that's a really dumb pun, seeing it. Um, C, you're normally used to seeing it as um, the speed of light in a vacuum. So normally people think of C as uh, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. That's not what we mean here. So C is actually the specific heat capacity. So that's precisely what we just talked about here. So specific heat capacity. And we can work out what units it is, because we don't have to memorize these units. Just think in your head, uh, think about getting C by itself. 
If you want to isolate for C, I'm just going to do it off to the side here. I mean, C would be equal to, well, you'd have a Q on the top still. And if you wanted C on its own, you'd have to get rid of the M on the bottom and get rid of the delta T. In other words, it would be like this. It would be Q over M delta T. And if that's the case, then I can work out the units. So you just do the units for this. So C, the specific heat capacity, will have units of, well, let's see, Q is measured in joules. So it's going to be measured in joules times, and then here we have uh, mass on the bottom, and we have temperature on the bottom. Now remember how we write things in the IB, we don't just say uh, kilograms, uh, sorry, we don't say per kilogram, we actually say kilogram to the minus one. That's the same thing as saying divided by. And we have delta T, in other words, uh, Kelvin to the minus one. Or it could be degrees Celsius, right? That doesn't matter. So that right there is how we deal with this. Now, uh, what te tends to happen when you're trying to solve questions for this or trying to use this in practice is uh, here's a nice trick here. This is the key thing here to using these is that the heat gained equals the heat lost. This is how I solve pretty much any question I see. Man, I really got to stop with the puns. I see. Um, anytime I see a question with specific heat capacity, you know, I'd say nine and a half times out of ten, uh, it's involving this idea here that the heat lost equals the heat gained. So what you do then when you see a question, um, normally it's going to be something that uh, sounds really crazy, like you know, I drop some some hot water into something else, and then they'll tell you what the mass is of each of them, and they'll tell you, you know, what's going to be the equilibrium temperature, maybe. In other words, you know, uh, if I drop some hot water in a cold bath, you know, then what will the temperature of the system become, the equilibrium? And the whole idea here is that it will reach equilibrium because there's a difference in temperature, so there will be a transfer of energy, which is this heat. And now there's going to be certain uh, things within the system that will gain energy and some of them will lose energy. The key thing here is that the entire heat gained is equal to the entire heat lost. This is again a version of conservation of energy. Right? Energy isn't, uh, I mean, it, it doesn't just disappear, it goes somewhere, right? So one of them loses energy because one of them gains it. In other words, energy just goes from one to the other. So the amount of heat lost by one part of the system is the exact amount that's gained. Of course, we're assuming ideal situations here where we don't lose any energy to the surroundings. We're assuming that this thing is in a perfect you know, a container that doesn't actually heat it up itself and all sorts of other things like that. Okay, but the key thing here is heat gained equals heat lost. In the next video, I'm going to show you an example of that. So that way we can uh, use this to make it make a little bit more sense.